I'm a heretic who believes in one God and Father of all, who is love, and therefore there cannot be any such thing as an unpardonable sin. We're going to look at what blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is and what that actually says because it doesn't say that it's unpardonable by God. And so this is the result of reading into the text things that aren't there. And in certain concepts of God, which are ludicrous and stupid. So what we have in the story was that Jesus was healing people and the religious leaders said that his healing came by the power of the prince of the devils. Jesus responded by saying, that doesn't make any sense. Healing comes from God. And he warned them that their way of thinking was toxic and dangerous. Not because God is going to get them, but because that way of thinking is going to be a mental prison from which they cannot escape. Or that they potentially won't escape because you've got to get out of that way of thinking in order to escape. So in modern usage, blasphemy can be made to mean to speak against, but that's actually that would actually be profanity. Whereas blasphemy actually means to elevate something wrongly to a position higher than where it belongs. Profanity is to wrongly drag something down from its high position where it belongs to its to a low position. So blasphemy against the Holy Ghost doesn't have anything to do with speaking ill. It has everything to do with wrongly elevating something. And what is being wrongly elevated? Well, we can see right there in the text, they said he's healing by the power of the Prince of the Devils. So what's being wrongly elevated is this concept of a rival God to God. That there's this other rival God a we, a, a, an evil rival God. And that evil rival God is going around healing people. And Jesus tries to point out that this is a nonsensical, ludicrous, stupid thinking, and that the logical result of this ludicrous way of thinking is that you're going to be stuck in a trap that you can't escape. And that's really what's happening here. So it's even more broad than this because it's really, if we want to define blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, the best definition of it is assigning to the devil that which is of God. So it's more than just healing. It's more than just, as it says in the text, casting out devils. But it's anything that would be that which is of God. It's anything that if if it's the kind of thing that you want to say God is, and then you make the devil that. Especially things like, you know, let's say something brings you peace. Well, then that's of God. And if you assigned the if you assign that as being of the devil, then that's blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. So if you have a devil that says, be okay with who you are, or you have a devil that says, accept people with other beliefs, or you have a devil that's unifying the world in one faith and one baptism and one religion and one world government, or you have a devil that says, there's one God and father of all, or you have a devil that says, we're all members of one body and one spirit, and that there isn't another body and another spirit or another father of other people. If you have a devil that does that, then you're committing blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. You're committing exactly what's being warned against. It's just rather than healing, it's some other thing that is of God that you're assigning to the devil. So once you define it properly, it can stop being this thing that you're terrified that you might accidentally do 
and might not ever be able to be released from, that God's going to hold that against you. Like God is bitterly clinging to the fact that you did this thing and that's it. You're done. I'm finished with you. Get out of here. Um, you can stop being terrified of that and start using it for what Jesus was actually pro- pro- uh, proposing here, which is that you can use it as an intellectual exercise to evaluate your thoughts. And you can think, wait, does this make sense? Because what did he say? He said, either make the tree good and the fruit good or make the make the tree bad and the fruit bad. I might have got that backwards. But what he's saying is that you judge the tree by the fruit. So you can't have good fruit healing and a bad tree, the devil. You can't have good fruit joy and a bad tree, the devil. You can't have good fruit peace and a bad tree, the devil. It doesn't make any sense. Either the tree is good and the fruit is good, or the tree is bad and the fruit is bad. James put it the same way where he said, uh, you know, out of the same fountain can't flow fresh water and bitter. You know, it's one thing or it's the other. It's very well defined. And you know it by its fruit. So what is that fruit? In In the case of this particular account, that fruit was healing. And so they were taking healing, which is good fruit, and calling it a work of the devil, which is a bad tree. So we go from there, and what I want to say is that the fact that the text says about uh, not being forgiven is then interpreted to unpardonable and unpardonable is not what it's saying to come up with unpardonable you've got to have a legalistic concept of God who has made a list of rules and if you break these rules you may or may not be able to be pardoned from the punishment for violating these rules it's a very crime and punishment concept of God when what it actually is 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 about a way of thinking and the trap and prison that you can end up with that way of thinking so blasphemy against the Holy Ghost and so okay so the word ghost the reason for this is that uh in the, the Latin text, it was Sanctus Spiritus, and that's what the Roman Catholic Church used. And when Martin Luther rejected the, the Catholic Church, he wrote a translation of the Bible in German. And in German, Sanctus Spiritus would be, whole, would be highly geist. And in a number of ways, the King James translation when when it was revised, liked to use the um, the the Martin Luther variation of things as its basis because it wanted to distinguish itself as a separate entity from the Roman Catholic Church. So then that's why, for example, all the words that start with J in German would be pronounced with a Y sound, and they kept the German spelling, but then pronounced it the way the English pronounces the letter J, which is which is really a derivative of the French pronunciation, which is more of a je. They, they've got that je sound to it. So then that's why instead of Jerusalem, or instead of Jerusalem, we have Jerusalem, and instead of Jacob, we have Jacob. Um, and it's useful to look at those not that it's an incantation or anything, but it's useful to look at those and think about the fact that the J should have been pronounced like a Y. You know, we we imported the spelling from German and the and the pronunciation from Franco-English tradition. It can be useful, especially in noticing how much the Ya root is in these names, um, because when it's there, the uh, 
at the beginning of the of the syllable we've converted it into J in a lot of the English spellings. Um, so it can be useful in understanding the the root of those names as being based on Yah as part of the name. So you have Yarushalom and you have Jacob, like you know, just understanding that Yah portion of the. So it can be useful to to mentally take those J's and think of them as Y's in in pronunciation mentally. But so we have in German Heiliggeist in uh in the uh Latin version it would be Sanctus Spiritus. I was stumbling over Latin. I was thinking Roman, Italian, <laughs> Pope, Popies. Uh, yeah, Latin. In the Latin, it's Sanctus Spiritus. In the German, it's Heilig Geist. So, Holy is derivative of Heilig. Ghost is derivative of Geist. Um, and that's has as, as its root uh, the same as what we get the word gust, if there's a gust of wind. And also to gasp, if I'm gasping for air. And also, uh, another root of that is is uh, ghastly, you know, which is, it's, it's, it sucks the, br the breath out of you. It's, it's so terrifying or horrifying or ugly or hideous that it sucks the breath out of you. That's ghastly. And, uh, if, if you see something like that, you're aghast, you know, all the breath has come out of you. So ghost really does reference, um, the idea of wind and breath the same way that spirit does the same way that pneuma in the greek does the same way that ruach in the hebrew does they all have to do with breath they all have to do with wind so it's uh, you know i think one of the reasons in modern times we're now moving towards using spirit more is because we've got this whole concept of ghost as being the disembodied energy of the former inhabitant, you know, so we've got ghost hunters going around, you know, we've got TV shows and they go to the, they go to the old abandoned house or the cemetery and they're trying to get evidence of, of the energy remains of a person who used to live there and they're not physically there anymore, but they're ghost remains. And so we kind of want to separate religiously this concept of ghost from what it actually is implying and so now we revert back to spirit which gives us a real weird term that's half latin and half german and we have holy spirit i don't care it's it's half a dozen of one and six of the other so i mean it really is synonymous to have holy spirit or holy ghost it's just when you say Holy Ghost, you're still kind of maintaining the fact that it's got a German root rather than mixing German with Latin. So that's my preference. That's why um, it's just kind of weird to mix languages that way. But English really is a mix of languages anyway, so it's not a big deal. So let's get into the text here. And it's mentioned in Mark chapter 3, Matthew chapter 12, and Luke chapter 12. Whereas the Matthew version is a little briefer than the Mark version, and the Luke version is just kind of weird. It's kind of like it, the where the part about the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is inserted is kind of like almost a non sequitur, it seems like. It's just, it's weird. It's all the way back in uh, Luke 11... 14 to 15 that the accusation of casting out devils by the prince of the devil occurred um, also Matthew chapter 9 verses 32 to 35 mentions the accusation of casting out devils by the devil but I prefer the Mark version because it gives you a more detailed story about the healing before getting to the brief speech about blasphemy against the Holy Ghost so we'll look at all of them just to look at the phrasing of what it has to say about this blasphemy. So again, blasphemy is wrongly elevating something 
to a position higher than where it belongs. And so in Mark chapter 3, let's start in verse 1. It says, He entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there with which had a withered hand. And they watched him, they being the Pharisees, the religious leadership, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. And he said to the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. And he said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. So he's contrasting doing good with causing harm, which is to do evil to think of as causing harm, to save life or to kill. Verse 5, And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, Stretch forth your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Now notice, he's grieved at the fact that they they don't have any interest in healing this guy because it happens to be Saturday and he's challenging their way of thinking to say their way of thinking you don't heal on Saturday you can snip the tip in fact if it's the eighth day you had better snip the tip if it's Saturday but you don't heal people on Saturday you've got six days a week to heal people don't do it on Saturday this grieved Jesus so if you've got a God who looks like Jesus or a Jesus who looks like God, you might want to consider the fact that to the Pharisees, to the religious leaders, there was no wrong time to snip the tip, but there was a wrong time to heal people. And to Jesus, there's no wrong time to heal people, which is the point being made there. But to them, there is a wrong time to heal people, which is part of what plays into this accusation. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jer Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon, and a great multitude. And when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. There are so many people. For he had healed many insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues and unclean spirits. When they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, You are the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. And he goes up into a mountain, calls unto him who he would, and they came unto him. And he ordained twelve, and so we go through that list there. And so... Now let's come down to verse 22, and here comes the accusation. Now they've just departed to go plot to destroy him with the Herodians. And so now they come back to him, and they say, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils he casts out devils. And he called unto, uh, and he called unto them, unto him and he said to them in parables how can satan cast out satan and if a kingdom be divided against itself that kingdom cannot stand and if a house be divided against itself that house cannot stand and if satan rise up against himself and be divided he cannot stand but has an end no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he will first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house verily i say unto you and here's the here's the the part we're focusing on. All sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemy is wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Because they said he has an unclean spirit. Now we look at the Matthew version, and I think at the at the end here, there's a there's another little bit that's nice that adds to the kind of thought exercise he's trying to propose here. He says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Which, reading into the text, what isn't there is to interpret that the world to come must be after you're dead. 
that's not there. It doesn't actually say that. That's a religious interpretation and an erroneous interpretation. He's not saying neither in this life nor in the afterlife. He's saying neither in this particular world uh, system or in any other uh, way of being in any other world system. It doesn't matter what kind of ruling system you have. If you have this thought process, it's going to be bad in any system. It's going to be bad under any circumstances. It's going to be bad under any government. It's going to be bad for primitive people and civilized people. This way of thinking is just toxic to its core and needs to be discarded. That's what it's it's implying here. It's not saying that it's not forgiven in this life and it's also not forgiven after you're dead. It's saying there's no of what you could call the world. And let's be clear here. We live in a different world than they had in the 1800s, but we live on the same plot of land. I live in a different world of my mom than my mom. We live in the same we live in the same community. You know, I live in a different world than the person in the house next to me and we live on the same street. So world doesn't doesn't mean what religion wants it to mean. Religion wants it to mean planet Earth, this life. But it doesn't mean that. It means exactly what it means the way people use it when they're not religious. It means exactly the same thing. I live in a different world than you. We live in the same house. You know? (laughs) What am I saying? I'm saying the way we see things is completely different. You know, we live in a different world than they did before the steam engine. What does it mean? It means our experience of life and the way we go about things is completely different. We don't have the same kinds of experiences. The structure is completely different. He's saying that it doesn't matter what kind of, quote, world, end quote, you live in. If you do this thing, this blasphemy against the Holy Ghost... You're in, you're going to have a problem. You're going to have a big problem. So here's the part that Matthew has that's really fantastic. Is verse 33. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. So what's the fruit? The fruit is healing in this particular account. So if healing is good, then the tree, meaning the healer, is good. And if the fruit is corrupt, then the tree, meaning the one performing the act, is corrupt. So this is, the whole thing, you can see the whole thing is an intellectual exercise. It's saying, what you are saying doesn't make sense. He starts right out, if Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How can Satan cast out Satan? What is he doing? He's challenging their way of thinking. Okay? He's saying... You don't make any sense. So that's why I love this addition in Matthew. It's, it's another intellectual exercise. Either make the tree good and the fruit good, or make the tree corrupt and the fruit corrupt. It's just like James says, you can't have the same water be both bitter, be both bitter and fresh. It doesn't make, you can't, whatever the source is, that's what comes out of it. You can't have... A, a, a evil tree that heals people that the, the gives fruit of healing you can't have a corrupt tree that gives healing fruit it doesn't work that way so if the if the tree is or if the or rather if the fruit is good then the tree is good and if the tree is good then the fruit is good they go together they're not separable you can't have a good tree and bad fruit or bad tree and good fruit it doesn't work so If peace is good, then the tree that gives peace is good. So that means the tree that gives peace can't be the devil. And the tree that gives musical talent can't be the devil. And the tree that gives joy can't be the devil. Because those things are good. So they must come from a good tree. 
So that's what I'm saying. If you've got a devil that unifies people, you're committing blasphemy of the Holy Ghost because unity is good. Unity is one of the central tenets of what we see throughout the New Testament message. Be at peace. Love one another. The commandment is love one another. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. There's... It, it, <laughs> It doesn't say to be divisive. So that's what we get nice out of Matthew. And then we'll go to Luke and and it's just, it doesn't, I don't even know how it fits in where it fits in. I've, I've tried. I haven't achieved success yet at trying to figure out why it's where it is. But nevertheless, the phrasing of it is, whosoever shall speak a word against the son of man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemes against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. So like I said, I prefer the Luke account. And if we look specifically at the part here dealing with blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, we see Mark 3, 28 and 29. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies worth, soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost has never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Again, reading into the text what isn't there, eternal damnation is perceived as being a place after you die because we know that our life here is not eternal so it's interpreted that that must therefore mean something that comes after death which would be then eternal but it doesn't actually say that and it doesn't say that it's God doing the not forgiving these are all things being read into the text we have to understand that what's being talked about here is a way of thinking. And so eternal damnation is referencing a way of thinking. So the Bible is too often treated as though it was written by people that don't use language the way normal people do. So when normal people say, man, that took me forever, it obviously didn't take all of eternity and is still continuously ongoing to this day thousands of years later it just means it was a a time where time slowed down and it was difficult to endure and if we really get into what eternal damnation is so damnation is to invalidate or void or to speak against, or to attack, or to harm. And eternal is this state, eternal damnation would be the state when, and if you've been there, you can relate to this. If you've ever just felt like everything is just darkness and void and there's no light and it's just like the darkness is suffocating and it hurts to breathe and you feel like if I have to continue to endure life another 10 minutes it's too long and nothing good can come of my continuing to exist there's nothing but darkness there is no light at the end of this tunnel things are only ever going to get progressively worse while that might actually come to an end there might be a termination to feeling that way while in the midst of it that's eternal damnation that's eternal torment because there's no perception of an end you don't see the end while you're in it you don't feel hope that there is an end. It's not that it's actually perpetually ongoing, but it feels that way while it's happening. Please understand, the people who wrote these things used language like normal people. They didn't lack sense of humor. They didn't avoid ridicule. They weren't some weird 
people that didn't know how to communicate properly. They used language just like everybody else. You can stop taking absolutely every single word apart and thinking, well, normal people use it that way, but not God. Please stop doing that. If you're doing that. Hopefully you're not. The people who wrote this used language the way that people use language. And even if it was directly written by the hand of God, God would be intelligent enough to communicate in the language of the people he's communicating to and would use language the way that people use language. He wouldn't be some weird, incapable of communicating properly, humorless jerk that doesn't know how to use words. So eternal damnation here has nothing to do with what happens to you after you're dead and has everything to do with what the topic of the passage is, which is a way of thinking. And that way of thinking is going to trap you in a prison. Now note here also that it says in danger of eternal damnation. It doesn't say he that blasphemes against the Holy Ghost does not ever have forgiveness, but is assured eternal damnation. So why is it only in danger? It means there's a return from it. What would the return from it be? Well, it's talking about a way of thinking. So it would be to change that way of thinking, to alter that paradigm. What is the paradigm being attacked here? To wrongly elevate a rival and a nemesis of God to the to the position of doing what God does in such a fashion as you can't discern the difference between whether it came from God or not. So when you have a devil that heals people and a devil that brings people joy and a devil that unites people and a devil that gives people magical musical abilities, that's blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And if you're doing that, you're going to be stuck in this trap and you might not escape from that trap all the way up until you breathe your last breath and die. Because it's such a toxic and self-sustaining way of thinking. Because nothing can ever knock you out of it. Because no matter what kind of good thing happens, you go, can I trust that? Did that come from God or did that come from the devil? Let me evaluate. Let me see what kind of person it was who said that or did that. And that's what they were doing. They said, this is not the kind of person that God would use to perform his works and God would never do this on a Saturday because you do not heal people on Saturday. So they, they looked at the wrong element to determine whether it came from God or not. They looked at what day of the week it was happening and what sort of person they had an evaluation of the sort of person doing the thing. They didn't look at the thing being done, which was healing. And they didn't say, oh, healing is good. This is a gift from God. Hallelujah. Praise God. This man is healed. But they looked at it and they said, this man's a drunk and a glutton. And he's doing work on Saturday, which is a violation of the law of Moses. This man is, he's doing the work of the devil. And so what Jesus said was, that doesn't make any sense. Healing can't be from the devil. Satan can't stand against Satan. And the tree, the tree and the fruit are both good or the tree and the fruit are both bad. Make up your minds. Your way of thinking doesn't work. And it's such a toxic way of thinking, you, you might not be able to escape it. You might never escape this. You might be stuck with this for the entirety of your life that you can look at somebody being healed and think, this might be a work of the devil. I mean, can you understand how toxic that is that you can see something wonderful and joyous happen and you can go, man, the devil's really working hard to trick people out of, out of worshiping God the right way. That's what he's saying. You might not escape this. There might not be something good enough to happen that you can shake free from going, I don't know, it might be a trick of the devil. If you can't stop assigning good things to the devil, how do you escape from it? How do you get out of that trap? 
you are in danger of never leaving that way of thinking. That's why you're in danger of eternal damnation. It's not God doing the not forgiving. And let's let's take that on again. Forgiving means okay, so this gets called the unpardonable sin. Now a pardon is to is to take a punishment and absolve somebody of that punishment. So it's to be absolved from guilt and excused from an offense. So that interpretation, which is reading into the text what isn't there, is to say that there, this is something that is a, a transgression. This is a, an offense. This is a crime of some sort. And then God is judge, jury, and executioner, and he's deciding that this particular offense is one that he will not pardon you from. That's it. You're done. This is the one thing you can't do. Screw you. Get out of here. This is also based on a very medieval concept of God that's completely stupid and ridiculous, where God is the tyrant king, and the tyrant king sits high up on a throne so he can see everything that's happening, because he's constantly suspicious of everybody, especially his own family, especially those closest to him. So he has to sit above everybody so he can see everything that's happening. That throne has got his back to the wall, and it's a stone-thick stone wall. So nobody can attack from through the wall. So he knows he's safe there. And anybody that comes towards him has to bow down. They have to, they have, to have no weapons, and they need to bow down and plant their face in the dirt. So they're, they can't even see him. So he knows he's sitting up there. He knows they're unarmed. He knows they can't do anything to him. It's safe to talk to this person. That's the concept of God as a tyrant who demands you shut up and do what you're told or else face the punishment because he's afraid of you. Let's be clear. The tyrant is always afraid that he's going to get knocked off. It's why he does what he does. It's why he demands loyalty. It's why he sits up on a throne. It's why he's above everybody. It's why you bow down to him. Everything is constructed to make sure that you are not a danger or a threat to him. And that's the concept that has been given to God. That's the sickening, perverse, satanic idol that has been pushed upon God is this deranged lunatic tyrant who's afraid for his life and is in fear of the people he's supposed to be taking care of. And we call that God. No, that's some deranged lunatic who, thank God, is now gone and we've replaced it with, with at least a better system of government. At least a better system where, you know, we're not being ruled by the next person who kills the person who, who took power before. And, you know, we can argue about various things there, but I'd rather not. It's better than being ruled by a tyrant, and God is not a tyrant. And God is not in fear for his life. In fact, one thing we can see with Jesus is that Jesus laid down his life. He even said, no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own. He said, don't even call it a murder. And he said, if you're going to kill me, then go ahead. He opened not his mouth but was led like a sheep to the slaughter. God doesn't point the finger at you from up high on his throne and say, bow down and make sure you don't have any weapons. What he does is he, he comes and they come to take him away and he says, hey man, you don't, you don't even need the weapons. I'm, I'm coming with you. It's no big deal, but why didn't you do this sooner? I mean, you know, I was there in the temple. Why didn't you come get me then? What's the deal? He goes willingly. Does, does does God look like Jesus or not? Does Jesus look like God or not? I mean, that's a question to ask right there. Is Jesus the good cop half of the of the bad cop? You know, Father's the bad cop, Jesus is the good cop, and Holy Ghost is the is the enforcer. I mean, that's a pretty toxic image of God right there. But what it's saying, it's talking about a way of thinking. And the way of thinking is that if you've elevated this wickedness 
to the position of doing the same things of, as God, indistinguishable from God. And now you need to be suspicious of good things that happen. You might not get an escape from that because no matter what good happens, you might attribute it to the devil. You might be stuck there. You might die and breathe your last breath and still be stuck there. Here's Matthew 9. It says, verse 34, that the uh, the accusation was happening in Matthew 9 as well. Verse 32, rather, as they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with the devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake and the multitudes marveled, saying it was never so seen in Israel. The multitudes going, wow, man, this is awesome. I've never seen anything like it. But the Pharisees said he casts out devils through the prince of the devils because he's a drunk and a glutton and, and a bastard. Uh, and he does healing on Saturday, which no man should do and is a violation of the law. So they're looking at the wrong things to judge it. The, the, the multitude, the mass, they were even like, wow, man, God is awesome. This is amazing. And he and so they have to turn around and go, oh, no, don't follow this guy because he doesn't adhere to our doctrines. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So there's that accusation where, where they made it, you know, in 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 a passage that wasn't related to mentioning the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. So here's what I want to say is, is we look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and we see the fruit of the spirit because Jesus said either the tree and the fruit are good or the tree and the fruit are bad. Well, what is the fruit? So if the fruit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, or temperance, which is self-control and meekness is actually another form of self-control because meekness is when you have the ability to destroy something, but you don't exercise your power for, for harm. I've heard it said that it's it's keeping your sword in its sheath. I like that explanation. Um, you know, it's it's being powerful but not using it in a way that hurts people. So that's what meekness is. Meekness isn't quite exactly the same as as how it's normally presented as just being like timid and fearful it's actually when it's it's the it's the kung fu master that when somebody punches them in the face just says you know i'm not sure you understand who you're messing with but go go in peace my brother that's meekness the dude could kill you in one swipe and he doesn't so Here's the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And it says against such, there is no law. And so if it's love, it's of God, not the devil. If it's joy, it's of God, not the devil. If it's peace, something that's very heavily in, in end times, the uh, scenarios attributed to a rival of God, uh, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self control, these are gifts of God. These are works of God. And so, if you see that coming from somebody who doesn't adhere to your denomination's doctrine and creeds, that's the wrong thing to look at. The thing to look at is whether it's love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, or temperance. If it is, it came from God. And those are, that's not a complete list. That's just, let's start there. But, I mean, when people write things and they make complete lists, it gets tedious. It's better to just give an illustration that's the starting point and we can work from there and go from there. And we have the same kind of thing with the, the, the quote, five-fold ministry. Like, those are just the five things he mentioned like there's more than just those five, but if you're really to list everything that is part of a ministry, it'd get ridiculous. Uh, the illustration is good enough. So it's not a complete list, but it's a very good start. It's, it's thorough enough to be a very good start. 
anything that comes into that is in harmony with any of it so work from there anything that's in harmony with love anything that's in harmony with joy anything that's in harmony with peace so for example unity it's not mentioned on the list but it's in harmony with those things or compassion that's not mentioned on the list but it's in harmony with those things so we can get a starting point because this isn't a comprehensive list this is an illustration and it's a very good starting illustration. And if we have those things, compassion can never come from the devil. That would be that would be blasphemy of the Holy Ghost to have somebody who's compassionate, but not acting in the will of God. To have somebody who is unifying people together in in any beneficial way is of God. It can't be of the devil. That's what we're saying here. That's what that's the illustration being made here about blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is to, to call those things of the devil is to wrongly elevate the devil to the position of being God. So now we go to Ephesians 2.13 and we see a little bit more about what, what God looks like in terms of peace and breaking down and unity it says but now in Christ Jesus you who are sometimes far off are made near by the blood of Christ for he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of two one new man so making peace and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Enmity, by the way, is the, uh, I guess you could say, the emotion associated with being enemies. It's the, it's the mindset of being enemies. So you could kind of awkwardly substitute having slain the being of enemies thereby. Um, so that's what enmity is, if you didn't understand that word. Uh, and came, so it says, he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So here we have a lot of language talking about reconcile, about slain the enmity. So we, we the cessation of being enemies, preached peace. Um, you know, unity, making of making of two one new man, so making peace. So, I mean, these are not things of the devil. These are this is this is what the Father looks like. This is what Christ looks like. This is the message being uh, promoted is that there's one spirit and one body, one new man, one new creation, and that, that all these other things are, are part of a toxic thinking that doesn't have anything to do with God. And so you can't have a trick of the devil that's, that's unifying people together because that's blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. You know, just because that particular illustration had to do with healing doesn't mean that it stops there. It, it continues out to everything and is, as I said, assigning to the devil that which is of God. And when you do that, then you constantly have this mental prison that you're trapped in where you say, I don't know, I mean, this unity might be of the devil because it's, you know, it's it's not it's not the kind of person doing this that I think... It should look like if it was really Christian. Well, that's blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. You're looking at the wrong thing. Instead of looking at the fruit to determine the tree, you're looking at the tree to determine, uh, you know, what kind of tree you think it is instead of looking at the fruit and going, oh, you know, it, it's it's a healing tree. <laughs> it's a unity tree. Well, that came from God. You know, you're you're looking at it and going, well, it's it's fruit is unity, but the the tree is corrupt. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't work, and that's the whole point Jesus was making, saying, "Are you guys out of your mind? How can Satan stand against Satan? That that's senseless. It's stupid." 
um, <laughs> it, it just doesn't work. So we go to Philippians 4, 4, and we have more references of how, how God and peace are related to each other, it, not, the, not the devil in peace. So in verse 4, Philippians 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Well, are you going to rejoice? You know, how how much can you rejoice if you got to be suspicious of the healing that you just got, or you got to be suspicious of of uh, you know that great song you just heard, and maybe the guy who wrote it was given magical musical abilities by the devil. Um, you know, if you got to be suspicious, how are you going to rejoice? How can you rejoice if you got to be suspicious of everything that happens and you know inspect the tree that it came off of to try and find out whether you can trust the fruit? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Wow, he's at hand. He's not afar off. He's not on planet third heaven that's inaccessible to all living people until they're dead if they've qualified. He's at hand. Emmanuel, God with us and within us. Be careful for nothing, but in everything... By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Well, let's see. Here's another list of things. Again, not the complete list, but a good illustration. If it's honest, it can't be from the devil. If it's pure, it can't be from the devil. If it's lovely, it can't be from the devil. If it's got any virtue, it can't be from the devil. If it's got good rep- if it's of a good report, it can't be from the devil. If it's praise, it can't be from the devil. Because otherwise, this is saying in the God of peace who is the devil shall be with you. Well, who is the God of peace? Is it the father or is it the devil and for that matter let's go to James 1 and here's here's my response because some people will say well you might think it's a good gift well that's bullshit man that's just trying to weasel your way out of saying that joy isn't really joy and and you know, whatever good isn't really good. What is James's warning here? Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So if it's a good gift, it can't come from the devil. And, you know, it's just bullshit to try and say, oh, that you, you thought that that was a good you know, that was a good gift, but it really wasn't, you know, no, it was, it was, it came from God. It wasn't from the devil. It wasn't a trick. That's the whole point being made. You know, like what else does James say? Uh, James has actually got a lot of great stuff. If you stop having the, the, if you stop having salvation, mean having God repent of the sadistic, cruel, disgusting things he plans to do to you when you're dead by performing whatever it is you need to perform to cause the transaction to happen, to cause God to repent of the things that he plans to do to you. And you start to make salvation as James is actually about, about, you know, healing and restoring here in this life, in this world. In fact, repent, it's actually kind of been understated. Like it's, it's been made kind of trivial. People say, oh, it's change your mind. It's not really change your mind. It's change your paradigm. Because I can change my mind about which color shorts I'm going to wear. That's completely trivial. I can change my mind about what restaurant I want to eat. That's completely trivial. But to change your paradigm is when you used to think that uh, you had to be suspicious of 
healing or joy or peace because of the source of that healing joy or peace might be the devil instead of God. That's changing your paradigm. Changing your paradigm is when you used to have my value is, is what I are. You are what you do. And my value is how well I do it to my value is that I am equal with God in God's eyes. And therefore all people are equally equally elevated not equally putrid which is the religious idea is to to say let's make all people equal by going to the lowest common denominator and make everybody equally putrid that's a paradigm change when you have these kinds of things that's a paradigm change so when you go from when you go from thinking that the kingdom is a geopolitical kingdom where we're going to kick out Rome and uh, reestablish a throne in Judea under a Davidic king and a military messiah is going to overthrow Rome and you change your paradigm to know the kingdom is here now and it's within you. And if you get born from above with that mindset to see things from a greater height, then you can see how the kingdom is within you. And God is Emmanuel, God with us and within us. And we are in the new creation. That's a paradigm change. That's not merely changing your mind about whether you're going to have a sandwich or a salad. That's trivial. So repent is to change your paradigm, your way of thinking from the law principle where people need to be coerced out of doing the things that the intents of their heart want them to do by the threat of punishment and the promise of reward to say to the grace principle that says when you continue to love one another, the intents of their heart will change and they will be healed and restored to come into alignment with love. And then you don't need to change their behavior because the intent of their heart will change. And that seems nonsensical to people. That's what it means when it says that the wisdom of God is foolishness to men. It doesn't mean if you thought it through and it makes no sense whatsoever, God probably thinks it's wisdom. And if you thought it through and it seems to make sense and it's logical and you can follow the logic of that and it adds up, then God thinks it's foolishness. It's talking about those paradigm changes. Like, here's a good example. Judge not that you be not judged. And what do people do? They turn around and they that seems so utterly stupid to them that they've got to find some loophole where it means don't judge if or don't judge when. When it says don't judge. That's what it means that the foolishness of God or, or the, the wisdom of God is foolishness to, to man or that what man thinks is foolish, God thinks is wisdom. It doesn't mean if you thought it through logically and it's completely stupid and nonsensical that that's the way God thinks. It just means that there's a very common paradigm in which this is dumb. There's a very common paradigm that says when somebody does something wrong, you return harm for harm. And there's a paradigm by, by Jesus that says, no, don't return harm for harm. Love your enemies. I even read somewhere somebody said, love your enemies is very bad advice. I mean, that's, that's my point. It's not that if you thought it through and it seems stupid, that, that's not what it is. It's about a paradigm. And the paradigm says, if I'm in danger, I'm in, if, if that paradigm puts me in danger, then so be it. My example is Jesus who said, you know, go ahead. I'm coming with you willingly. No man takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own. You know, that's, that's nonsense to typically. But we go to James chapter three in verse 13 through 18, it says, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge? Speaking of what the wisdom of God is. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. So what is devilish? What is the wisdom that's not from above? It's Envying, bitter envying and strife. And it mentions it again, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. 
But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Again, we have another wonderful list here. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Hmm. Well, if you have a devil that's making peace, is he sowing the fruit of righteousness? That doesn't make any sense. What is devilish? It even has the word devil, envying, bitter envying and strife, confusion and every evil work. What is the wisdom from above? Pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Easy to be into. How many messages have I heard in my life about easy is from the devil, gentle is from the devil, mercy is weakness? Good. Ah, it's, yeah. it's it, it blows my mind that I can be looking at this verse. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And to take those things and assign it to the devil, that is the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. That's it right there when you make those things of the devil. And what are you going to do? You're in danger of being stuck in an inescapable prison. And you can't escape it because no matter how good something is, you're suspicious of it. There's no God that's clinging to what you've done and going, well, that's just too much. To hell with you. That's ludicrous. That's absolutely ludicrous. So let's take a look at this supposed this is this is allegedly about God's supernatural spirit nemesis in in Isaiah chapter 14. And basically people only know one verse of it and think that's what the devil looks like and so that's where they get the idea of a counterfeit god. But let's look at what it actually says. And so even if it's about some supernatural immortal spirit being and not about who it says it's about, uh, we, can, we can identify the characteristics of this immortal rival to God because it's not going to look like God. I can assure you of that if we actually just simply read the passage and see what it says. So let's start in Isaiah 14, chapter 1. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of, of, of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives whose captives they were. And they shall rule over their oppressors. Now, let me just pause there and say, that's exactly the idea that in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus took out the vengeance of the day of the Lord, that's exactly the principle that he was saying, no, that was wrong, is the, the whole, you shall rule over your oppressors thing. And he took that away. He said, vengeance isn't something that's part of God. And then they wanted to kill him because that's what they're clinging to. Their, their paradigm was that their hope was in becoming the oppressors not of just, you know, not having oppression. <laughs> you know, you could just not have oppression, but that didn't occur to them. That was a paradigm that they needed to change. So anyway, verse three, and it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give you rest from your sorrow and from your fear and from the hard bondage wherein you were made to serve. Okay, so wait, what what were they under? They were... Sorrow, fear, and hard bondage. And the Lord will give you rest from those. So so that's, you know, the, the anti-sorrow and the anti-fear and the anti-hard bondage and the anti-being made to serve is is what we can we can look at God here. Verse four, that you shall take up this proverb against God's supernatural spirit rival, immortal demigod 
Oh, wait, that's not what it says. Well, we can't take that part literally. We got to take the, the other part literally. So we'll just pretend like that doesn't actually say the king of Babylon and make it a supernatural spirit rival. But anyway, and say, how has the oppressor ceased? Wait, the oppressor? So he's already being identified as oppressor. The golden city ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. Let's see what this king of Babylon slash potentially the supernatural spirit nemesis of, uh, of God. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. Wait, isn't that what God's supposed to do to all the, all the sinners and reprobates after they're dead? And yet the king of Babylon is being criticized for doing exactly what God is attributed as being. He that smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hinders. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. The whole earth is, is singing. Yea, the fur joys... Fur, now, here's maybe your first hint that this is poetic language. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at you and the cedars of Lebanon saying, since you are laid down, no feller has come up against us. There's no, there's nobody cutting down the trees. Hell from beneath is, is moved for thee to meet you at your coming. It stirs up the dead for you. Even all the chief ones of the earth, it has raised up from their thrones, all the Kings of the nations. Are, are we seeing like night of the living dead happening here? Or is this poetic language? Maybe the king of Babylon was the one part you could take literally, and the rest of it is poetic language. But nevertheless, what kind of character is being described here? It's not something that looks like God, unless you've got a satanic, sadistic, cruel, tyrannical God. Then it looks exactly like God. All they shall speak and say unto you, Are you also become as weak as we? Are you become like unto us? Okay, so here's the people that are oppressed saying, are you just every bit as weak and hopeless as we are? Your pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of your vials. The worm is spread under you and the worms cover you. Here's the only part that most people know. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Well, even right there, which did weaken the nations. But here's the only part anybody knows. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That is the central doctrine that's made out of this passage is don't think you're going to be anything like God. Like that's what went wrong. That's the one little passage here. And it's it's described like the whole entire thing is that he had too high too high of a estimation of himself. Yet you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see you shall narrowly look upon you and consider you, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? That's exactly the the after death scenario people have of God that God is going to make the earth tremble shake kingdoms make the world as a wilderness burn the fuck out of everything destroy everything that exists and not ever open the house of the prisoners if this is actually about the devil it's the devil that does that but this is about the king of Babylon all the kings of the nation, even them, even all of them lie in glory, everyone in his own house. But you are cast down out of your grave like an abominable branch and like as a raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden under feet. You shall not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed the land and slain your people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned destroyed the land and slain thy people. Which one is the, which one, if there are two gods, has that character? Which one doesn't open the prisons? 
Which one destroys the land? Which one kills everybody? If there's an unpardonable sin, then God is the one that opens not the house of his prisoners. So let's close. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. <laughs>